Hello, listeners, and welcome to Shattering Superstructure, a podcast that breaks through the majority opinion and mainstream culture. I'm your host, Alex Arabian, a journalist who explores the value of art for the sake of art. In these interviews, in which I'll have occasional co-hosts, there will be no scoops, no juicy bits, and no hidden agendas, just a safe space in which one can think as one wishes and say what one thinks. And on that note, let's get to the episode. Thank you for listening. Hello, listeners. Welcome back. So the Scream spoiler embargo is March 13th. So I thought I would share my full Scream review. I know I only had a few words to say about it in the last episode, but... Uh, I thought it was a beautiful continuation of the franchise. You know, the new setting worked. Uh, It's been done before in Friday the 13th Part 8. Jason takes Manhattan, Wes Craven's new nightmare in L.A., and now with Scream uh, in New York. The latter two had better results critically. Uh, New Nightmare is a brilliant film, and I think, Wes Craven's first foray into the meta horror world, which he would expound upon with Scream. Uh, I think Courtney Cox and Mason Gooding are the standouts for their performances. Um, and really just uh, Mason Gooding especially is is awesome. I think he and Jenna Ortega are, you know, the new court or the the new Nev Campbell and um, Dewey because they're kind of making it a pattern uh, that, you know, Mason Gooding's character um, keeps just making it out alive. So uh, the set pieces are are bigger and more inventive with uh, New York City and the kills are way more brutal than any other scream except for maybe Drew Barrymore's opening scene in the original simply because of the the tragic context with her parents only a few yards away uh, and them finding her hanging with her guts open Uh, that was pretty brutal I will say getting stabbed in the nose and eye is particularly unique uh, for the series, apart from, I suppose, Anthony Anderson's forehead stab in Scream 4. Uh, you know, I didn't su- uh, suspect who one of the killers were until right before the third act. And uh, it turns out there are three killers. Dermot Mulroney, um, Liana Liberato, and Jack Champion's characters as the parent and siblings of Jack Quaid's Richie from Scream 5. And the shrine you see in the trailer uh, of ephemera from every Scream movie and some stab collector's items is actually a tribute to Richie built by Dermot Mulroney's uh, Detective Bailey. And I, I suppose that makes sense how he was able to obtain all of the Woodsboro evidence uh, to get the ghost face costumes and murder weapons used in each scream, as well as uh, Stu's TV, among other things. But I feel like that would raise a lot of suspicion from the Woodsboro Police Department. Uh, It's a a bit far-fetched, but it's also a great tribute to the franchise itself. You know, it's, it's a room full of nostalgia uh, with, with so many items uh, that really evoke that that nostalgia for previous films. Um, so this is going to be, you know, a treasure trove for Scream fans. Uh, you've got Dewey's badge, Randy's video store uniform, etc., etc. But I want to leave some of them, you know, a mystery to people who haven't seen the film yet. Uh, but most likely people who are listening to this are aware that it's um, a review with spoilers. So overall, the film is is great. And I think it certainly argues for more Scream films uh, and obviously leaves the door open 
for the next movie. Uh, Skeet Ulrich is back um, as Billy Loomis. And I think he appeared maybe a little too late uh, in the film. Um, and his his presence was at, at first random, but then it was kind of... Uh, it, it kind of fit the narrative a bit more, um, I think, in the resolution after the climax. It's kind of interesting to see that one of the core four as they call themselves uh or as mason gooding's character insists they call themselves uh could be the next scream killer i mean we already saw in um you know the previous scream that sam carpenter doesn't fuck around and she's got some dark dark um <laughs> presence in her uh, not only with billy but her i think affinity for for killing um and and blood uh, so she, you know at the end it kind of uh, she 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 grabs the ghost face mask uh that billy used in the first film um kind of before um I think I guess it was admitted into to evidence uh, as the police and paramedics were on the scene. Uh, so she stares at it, and there's this dark uh, s s sort of air of the score playing towards it uh, or over it. So, uh, excuse me, and it's um, but then she, you know, tosses it at the last second. And, uh, you know, I would say uh, if there was a, a Scream 7, which is highly likely, uh, that it would be extremely interesting to see her as the killer and what her motive would be. Um, and also, in the film, they... Uh, reveal that you know the fan theory that that Stu is st still alive and they keep that um, open I suppose uh, whether or not Stu is uh, alive or not so he could be also a potential killer in the next film but um, I think one of the directors confirmed that uh, Stu is dead last year you know it, it's it's of course they wouldn't say he's live um, and if they said oh I can't tell you that then that automatically gives it away that he is alive <laughs> so I, I it could be a sort of a tweak out um, and you know pivoting from that I also wanted to give my thoughts on the whale and some of the backlash it received for it, you know, uh, it's portrayal of a 600 pound man. Uh, so, so Darren Aronofsky's film, uh, boasts arguably the greatest or one of the greatest, um, performances, you know, in the history of cinema by Brendan Fraser as severely morbidly obese man named Charlie, and that's a medical term used by the United States National Library of Medicine. Um, and Charlie also suffers from major depression and binge eating. Uh, the film itself as a whole is spectacular as well. And an unprecedented look at the link between these two disorders and how they can lead to, to severe uh, morbid obesity. Um, however, some critics have uh, rather ignorantly misjudged this film as, you know, a misrepresentation of, of the morbidly obese, fo focusing solely on the film uh, as a portrayal of the condition of obesity, even though it depicts one man's psychologically intricate journey. You know, this is just one person. It's not meant to... Uh, be a larger representation or, you know, one movie that represents the whole fat community. Um, 
it's been called fat phobic, uh, body horror, torture porn with a fat suit rather than a meat cleaver as the bringer of cinematic shock, uh, mean spirited, hateful and vile, uh, an act of hate that a disguise as tough love in a film lacking any hint of true empathy and understanding. Uh, these people pointed and gawked at the film, hiding their disgust for an accurate physical representation of a 600-pound person on screen uh, for the first time ever by virtue signaling, you know, with some even making offensive weight and food punts in the process to describe their hatred of not the film, but the image of someone struggling with obesity. Um, morbid obesity and major depress order, uh, per- depressive order, excuse me, uh, for that matter. So these critics are, are patently false, um, you know, perpetuating fat phobia in the process, ironically. If they had anything else to say about the film other than its portrayal of weight and their att- attempt to conflate everyone in the obese community as one, you know, then it might come off as more subjective rather than a statement of anger about a dying, severely, morbidly obese man. So, you know, what do morbid obesity and major depressive order disorder have in common? Well, according to the United States National Library of Medicine, the largest biomedical library in the world, uh, it says that previous research indicates that a high proportion of individuals with major depressive disorder, MDD, uh, meet the criteria for food addiction and are also at an increased uh, risk of weight gain and chronic disease. Nearly 25% of people with major depressive disorder experience food addiction. And obesity as a blanket term um, and its you know repercussions constitute an important source of morbidity, uh, impaired quality of life, and its complications can have a major bearing on life expectancy with cardiovascular disease from which Charlie suffers being one of the main causes of death in people with obesity. According to the NLM, the classifications of people who are larger than others are overweight, obesity, severe obesity, morbid obesity, and severe morbid obesity, the last category into which Charlie falls, as I've said. The irony in many of these negative reviews is that most of the critics blasting it are themselves fat phobic, even using, you know, as I've said, um, and even using offensive, like, faux clever descriptions um, and fat and food puns to describe its shortcomings. Here are some of uh, the ones that are just ridiculous larded with melodrama Aronofsky's heavy head heavy handed film is crushed by the weight of its own self importance a massive performance as a mammoth man Uh, the effect is one of pay the nickel see the freak overcooked nonsense the whale itself has mobility issues (laughs) it goes nowhere it threatens to buckle under its own weight these, these, it's, these are brutal. There's precious little truth to in Charlie's job-like buffet of tri- of tribulations. The last ten minutes of the whale are, are sublime. Everything else is just dead weight. Uh, sees Aronofsky once again biting off more than he can chew. We've all heard that term before with critics. Uh, usually they say that when they don't have anything to say at all. Uh, the whale is a mammoth undertaking lacking in subtlety and compassion that leaves the viewer gasping for air on the beach. You know, that evokes a, an image of a, a beached whale. It's just, did any of these people understand how offensive their lampooning of the film was to the obese community? Uh, further, you know, did anyone from the, these reviews take a step back and do their research about the various stages of obesity? No. Uh, did they realize that this is one case of a man who became depressed to the point of binge eating to cope with said depression until he reached this weight? No. Did they realize that this is a portrayal of one man 
uh, not a representation of an entire diverse community. No. They consider that the Obesity Action Coalition, the OAC, a nonprofit that raises awareness, improves access to prevention and treatment of the disease of obesity and fights to eliminate weight bias and discrimination, which acted as a consultant on Aronofsky's film, would participate if the film negatively portrayed the fat community? No. Uh, the OAC would ha want to have nothing to do with this film if it didn't accurately portray um, a severely a, a 600 pound person. Um, and, and so um, the OIC defines weight bias as negative attitudes, beliefs, judgments, stereotypes, and discriminatory acts aimed at individuals simply because of their weight. This is exactly what these critics are doing. Aronofsky merely acts, asks you know, he acts, excuse me, as a fly on the wall to portray the character of Charlie in such a realistic way that it borders on Italian neorealist film filmmaking. Uh, sure, the overweight and obese, even severely obese, among the fat community can live active, healthy lives. But again, Charlie suffers from severe morbid obesity. Uh, it is called morbid for a reason. Uh, Merriam-Webster classifies morbid as affected with or induced by disease. And Charlie has several diseases, one of which is congestive heart failure, as I've uh, mentioned already. And, and these critics classify it as vile and horrifying. You know, even uh, to the point of calling it torture porn. Um, all because of a story about how one human being's depression led to, led to severe morbid obesity. Uh, Rob Simonson's score echoes the feeling of major depression, I think, when, when Charlie attempts to cope with his pain and binge eat. Um, and it captures the feeling of, of hopelessness perfectly. I mean, that was one of the criticisms I think I read somewhere was that, oh, the score is dark when he's binge eating. Well, I mean, do you ex expect these scenes to have an uplifting score? Um, a man who's who's essentially killing himself with with food um, because it's it's one of the, the few, uh, um, I suppose, uh, pleasures, uh, however short lasting that that allows him to cope with this major depressive disorder. Um, so that's kind of a secular matter in that way, how one causes the other and other, uh, the other sort of temporarily, temporarily alleviates the pain of the former. So, um, you know, and I've been there I, I, and I know what it's like. Uh, when I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder, I also developed a binge eating disorder to ease my pain. I stuffed my face with fatty foods like Charlie did. I would hear myself chewing and swallowing anything I could find to ease my pain. Uh, it, it, it's uh, this internal um, awareness of the self-destruction I was doing is, is, is encapsulated accurately by uh, sound effects editor Cole Anderson. You know, I gained 100 pounds in four months developing health issues for a reason uh you know my blood pressure uh, and cholesterol levels went through the roof so it's it's not easy to imagine charlie gaining 300 pounds over the course of several years with the same diagnoses as me so what is the real reason people are so upset about a severely morbidly obese man with binge eating and major depressive disorders uh, because of their own lack of understanding, their own prejudices, and their own quote-unquote horror at the sight of a 600-pound man with his shirt off, binge eating, or simply going about his daily routines, uh, taking showers, uh, you know, brushing his teeth, shaving, uh, getting out of bed. It disgusts them, so they feign activism, claiming to speak for the entire fat community, amalgamizing everyone in it in the process, and that is an act of hatred um, disguised as empathy. So uh, the whale's intention is to challenge people to think about their own prejudices. The ignorant refused and instead channeled their inability to accept, accept Charlie's lifestyle and disorders as realistic, real-world uh, issues from which certain people 
uh, suffer, uh, and they uh, channeled it into faux activism and more opportunities to use offensive subject matter related puns in their reviews just to get uh, the, the hopes of getting more website traffic or clicks or, or notoriety. Uh, the critics immediately defaulted to, this is gross, you know, in a variety profile, Aronofsky said, there are people out there who are going to immediately shut down when they see a character like Charlie. I want people to con uh, to connect to the film. I hope they do. And uh, yeah, the critics shut down to say the least and didn't even bother to do the research into what Charlie suffers from. They refused to connect with him, refused to accept that there are people like this. Fraser, however, did the research, consulting with as many people with the same intertwining diagnoses as Charlie's. Uh, so ABD, ABC News said the whale is uh, leavened by or leavened in those moments when Fraser's boyish giggle and bright-eyed wonder peek through heartbreaking reminders of a persona that once lit up movie screens with goofy charm. Frasier isn't a persona. He's a human being. He himself has gained weight since he quote-unquote lit up movie screens decades ago. As Frasier told Newsweek, I'm not a small man and I don't know what the metric is to qualify to play this role. I only know that I um, had to to give as honest a performance as I can. Uh, why is this heartbreaking? What about his comeback um, and his portrayal that eerily resembles his own depression and weight gain as a result of a tragedy in his own life is heartbreaking in the context of the will. It isn't. An overweight ap actor inhabiting a role of, of one man in the fat community who happens to have a sto story uh, similar to Charlie's is, is not something to mourn. It's something to celebrate. Finally, we are seeing stores, stories on screen about real people in the fat community with diverse backgrounds and reasons for their larger appearance uh, on various tiers of the fat spectrum, uh, as outlined by the NLM. Unfortunately, the masses are rejecting them due to their own prejudices. Now, that's heartbreaking. So I, I would um, like to wrap this up by, by giving my uh, just a few of my Oscar pr predictions. I think Brendan Fraser will win Best Actor. Ki Hui Kwan will win Best Supporting Actor. The Daniels will win Best Director, or di Directors in this case. Uh, the Fablemans for Best Picture, or Tar for Best Picture. That's going to be a tough one. Uh, Michelle Yeoh for Best Actress. Hong Chao for Best Supporting Actress. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio for Best Animated Film, All Quiet on the Western Front for Cinematography, Fire of Love for Best Documentary, Everything Everywhere All at Once for Best Score, Rihanna for Best Original Song, and um, that's all I got for Oscar predictions. I, I haven't really it's difficult to to choose um sound design and editing uh, especially when you've got avatar and top gun both on the the um the roster of nominations uh so we'll see uh this episode will come out on the 13th so uh yeah we'll see which ones i got right and which ones i got wrong um, thanks so much for listening to my screen review, my thoughts on the whale, and some of my Oscar predictions. I will see you next time, listeners. This is Alex, signing out. <laughs>